I gave you an introduction about what is this AIDS, what is the full form of AIDS. AIDS, you know, is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Then I told you about the causative agent of AIDS, that is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Then we discussed about mode of infection of this AIDS, how this AIDS spreads from one infected person to other non-infected person. So as you know now, AIDS mostly spreads from infected person to non-infected person through unprotected sexual intercourse. In addition to this unprotected sexual intercourse, AIDS may also spread from an infected person to a normal person through contact of body fluids. If there is unchecked blood transfusion, unchecked organ transplantation, unchecked artificial insemination, or there is a deep oral kissing between an infected person and a normal person, then they are likely to spread the AIDS, that they are likely to contact the AIDS, right? Then I also told you that AIDS also spreads from an infected person to other non-infected person by sharing of hypodermic needles and syringes. This practice is mostly done by drug addicts. They share the hypodermic needle and the syringe for inoculating drugs. So if one of them is infected and the uh, syringe and needle is shared by others, they are also likely to get infected, right? Now today we will discuss what is the incubation period for this AIDS, incubation period. As I told you earlier, what is this incubation period? It is the time from the entry of pathogen into the body till the manifestation of first symptoms. So incubation period for AIDS is 15 to 57 months. Average incubation period is 28 months. So it takes a considerable amount of time for developing the first symptoms. So Incubation period varies from 15 months to 57 months. Average incubation period is 28 months. Then we will discuss what are the symptoms of the AIDS. AIDS is characterized by a lung infection known as pneumocystic pneumonia. AIDS is characterized by a lung infection. The persons who are HIV positive, they suffer from a lung infection, a lung dis disease, known as a pneumocystic pneumonia. This pneumocystic pneumonia, it is caused due to a fungus. It is caused due to a fungus. That fungus is known as pneumocystis, pneumocystis gyrovici, Gyrovici pneumonia is the name of the fungus which causes, causes this lung infection. Pneumonocystic pneumonia is a lung infection. So the first characteristic feature of AIDS patients is that they suffer from a lung infection. That lung infection is known as pneumocystic pneumonia and it is caused by a fungus. That fungus is known as Pneumocystis gyrovici pneumonia, right? <coughs> the second characteristic feature of AIDS is Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's sarcoma is a type of skin cancer. Is a type of skin cancer which is caused due to oncogenic. Oncogenic DNA viruses, cancer causing DNA viruses, they cause this Kaposi sarcoma. In earlier times, this Kaposi sarcoma, it was known as idiopathic multiple. It was in earlier times known as idiopathic multiple because many organs suffer from this skin cancer. Idiopathic means of unknown cause. Later on, it was worked that this skin cancer, these skin cancers, they are caused due to oncogenic DNA viruses and they are now known as collectively as Kaposi sarcoma. These two symptoms, pneumocystic pneumonia and Kaposi sarcoma, they are present almost in 70% of AIDS patients. 70% of AIDS patients. That means 70% AIDS patients, 70% HIV positive persons, they manifest these two symptoms. 
lung infection, pneumocystic pneumonia, and second cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma. This pneumocystis jurovici pneumonia, it is present in the soil. Almost every person is infected by this fungus. So it enters along with dust and dirt into the lungs of almost every person. But our immune system subsides this fungus. Our immune system keeps this fungus in control so that it doesn't develop any lung infection in normal people. But those persons who are suffering from AIDS, they have complete lack of immunity. Due to lack of immunity, this fungus overpowers them and it occupies the whole lungs, right? And it causes the lung infection, pneumocystic pneumonia. Otherwise, it is present in almost every person. But our immune system is working, it suppresses the fungus. It doesn't allow the fungus to grow. It doesn't allow the fungus to cause the infection. But those persons who are suffering from lack of immunity, in them the fungus grows and causes the lung infection, pneumocystic pneumonia. So they develop a pneumonia. Kaposi sarcoma, it is caused by oncogenic DNA viruses. These oncogenic DNA viruses, they may enter into the body of a normal person. But normal person's immune system suppresses them, controls them, and doesn't allow them to develop cancers. But in AIDS patients, due to lack of immunity, these viruses, they develop, they multiply, and they cause the skin cancers. These skin cancers, they start from the soles of the feet. Purple patches develop on the soles of the feet first. Then they spread to lower legs, then to thighs, then to whole body. So the skin of this AIDS patient, it is having characteristic purple patches. And those characteristic pur purple patches, we show uncontrolled growth and division. They form the Kaposi's sarcoma, right? Then another important symptom of the AIDS is chronic encephalitis. Chronic encephalitis. Encephalitis means inflammation of the brain. Chronic encephalitis. Scientific name of brain is encephalon. Encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. Right? This is caused by a protozoan parasite. It is caused by a protozoan parasite. Toxoplasma. Toxoplasma gondii. So this chronic encephalitis, inflammation of the brain in AIDS patients, it is caused by a protozoan parasite, Toxoplasma gondii. So it is also known as Toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis. It is another important symptom of the AIDS patients. Then they develop another symptom that is known as thrombocytopenic, thrombocytopenic purpura. This thrombocytic, this thrombocytopenic purpura, it is decreasing, abnormal decreasing. Abnormal decrease in number of number of platelets platelets thrombocytes platelets they are also known as thrombocytes so abnormal decrease in number of platelets it is known as thrombocytopenic thrombocytopenic purpura it is characterized by less than 20,000 platelets per cubic millimeter of blood. So in an AIDS patient, the number of circulating platelets in blood follows very low. It gets lower than 20,000 per cubic millimeter of blood. What is the normal range? 
The normal range for platelets is 2 to 3 lakhs per cubic millimeter of blood. So in a healthy normal person, there are 2 to 3 lakhs of platelets per cubic millimeter of blood. But in AIDS, this platelet count extremely falls. It gets low, less than 20,000 per cubic millimeter of blood. This is another characteristic feature of AIDS patients, right? They also develop lymphomas. Lymphoma. That means cancer of lymphatics. Cancer of lymphatics. Their lymphatic system, it develops cancers. Their lymph nodes, they develop cancers. Their lymph vessels, they develop cancers, right? So this is another feature of, another symptom of AIDS patients, right? Then they also suffer from wasting syndrome. Wasting syndrome. That means they become, they lose weight, they lose weight and show general weakness and show general weakness. They become very weak. So these are some characteristic symptoms of the AIDS. So now AIDS is characterized by pneumocystic pneumonia, lung infection. Their lungs get blocked because of the fungal growth. They suffer from Kaposi sarcoma. Their skin develops multiple cancers. The cancers start from the soles of feet, then they spread to lower legs, upper legs, then on the trunk, and then arms and other parts of the body. They also suffer from chronic encephalitis. Encephalitis means inflammation of the brain. This inflammation of the brain, it is caused by a protozoan parasite, Toxoplasma gondii. So for that reason, it is also known as Toxoplasma. Various patients, they also show thrombocytopenic purpura. Abnormal decrease in the number of platelets. The normal range of platelets in an adult healthy person is 2 to 3 lakhs per cubic millimeter of blood. But in AIDS, this platelet count gets abnormally low. It is characterized by just less than 20,000 platelets per cubic millimeter of blood. So because of lack of platelets, they suffer from bleedings. They suffer bleeding through nose, bleeding through eyes sometimes, bleeding through ears, bleeding through anus, bleeding through mouth, right? It is because of lack of the circulating number of platelets, right? They also suffer lymphomas. They suffer from cancers of lymphatics. And they show wasting syndrome. That means they lose weight and they become general, they show general weakness. These are some characteristic symptoms of the AIDS patients, right? These AIDS patients, they are also characterized by fall in T helper cell count. They are also characterized by AIDS is diagnosed by making the helper T cell count. In AIDS patients, the helper T cell count, helper T cell count, or we call it also as CD helper T cells, they are also known as CD4 plus cells. Helper T cells are also known as CD4 plus cells. Their number abnormally decreases. Their count abnormally decreases in AIDS patients. It is less than 200 per cubic millimeter of blood. The normal range of Normal range of helper T cells is anyway between 500 to 1200 per cubic millimeter of blood. This is the normal range of helper T cells. In our 1 cubic millimeter of blood, we have 500 to 1200 T helper cells, helper T cells or CD4 cells in our blood. But in case of AIDS patients, this number gets abnormally very low. So, a number of less than 200 per cubic millimeter helper T cells 
it indicates AIDS. So it is a diagnostic feature of AIDS, right? So these are some symptoms which are shown by AIDS patients. Now, how we can diagnose this AIDS? So one of the methods of diagnosing, diagnosing AIDS is this helper T cell count. But mostly it is diagnosed by a test that is known as ELISA, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. AIDS is mostly diagnosed by ELISA. ELISA, enzyme linked. Immunosorbent, immunosorbent assay, enzyme link linked immunosorbent assay, right? Or PCR, polymerase chain reaction, polymerase chain reaction. It can be used for diagnosing, diagnosing AIDS or Western blot, another test, Western blot. These tests may be used for diagnosis of the AIDS. The most commonly used test for diagnosing AIDS is ELISA, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay or PCR, polymerase chain reaction or Western blot. So these are the tests which are used for diagnosing, diagnosing AIDS, right? And a CD4 count less than 200 per cubic millimeter of blood. That is also a diagnostic measure of the AIDS, right? So that indicates full balloon AIDS. That represents full balloon AIDS. So these were some symptoms and the diagnosis of AIDS. Just a minute. Hard to rub this board. So, as I told you, prevention is better than cure. How we can prevent ourselves from contacting AIDS? So that is known as prophylaxis. Prevention of AIDS. So how can we protect ourselves from contacting AIDS? <clears throat> we know now what is the method of contacting AIDS. If we avoid all those practices, then we will not contact the AIDS, right? For example, AIDS spreads through prostitution or by unprotected sexual intercourse, right? So avoiding prostitution, avoiding prostitution, Avoiding homosexuality, avoiding prostitution, avoiding homosexuality, maintaining, maintaining strict monogamous relationships, monogamous relationship. will help us in avoiding AIDS, right? You know, in prostitution centers, there are sex workers, female sex workers. They provide sex for money. So these female sex workers, they are visited by many males during a single day. So if a single woman gets infected, and all those men who make unprotected sexual intercourse with that woman, at prostitution center, they are all likely to get infected. So prostitution is the main cause of spread of AIDS. 
so one should completely avoid prostitution similarly there are some groups of men who are involved in homosexuality that means sexual intercourse between or sexual activity between persons of the same sex for example male a man and a man male and a male similarly there are lesbians females when a female is sexually attracted to another female that they are known as lesbians so this homosexuality it is done in groups there are many men who assemble in groups or who have contact in groups and they go for homosexuality so if one of them is infected he is likely to infect others similarly females who are sexually attracted to each other they may also spread this disease right because these homosexual men and women they have formed groups in our society and they go for sex between themselves right so if we avoid homosexuality then we are not likely to get aids if we avoid prostitution then we are not likely to contact aids right maintaining strict monogamous relationship if a person gets married and he keeps his sexual relationship only with his wife or a female gets married and if she keeps sexual relationship only with her husband then they are not likely to contact aids right so if a person maintains strict monogamous relationship keeps only sexual relationship with one person then they are not likely to get aids similarly making blood transfusions blood transfusions organ transplantations or insemination or artificial insemination artificial insemination after proper checking after proper checking will prevent the spread of aids many times aids is spread in the hospitals a person suffers from a serious road accident he is rushed immediately to the hospital doctor declares that he needs blood and many volunteers they come forward and they say come on we will we are ready to donate the blood but before the transfusion is made all those volunteers they should be checked whether they are hiv negative or not if any one of them is hiv positive his blood should not be accepted if blood is provided by blood bank it should be checked first whether this blood is hiv negative or not blood banks they they need to stamp their blood packets hiv negative after proper testing if the blood is negative blood banks are advised not to take blood from hiv positive persons similarly artificial insemination it should be only done after it is confirmed that this semen has not been donated by an hiv positive person right similarly we should avoid sharing of needles and hypodermic needles and syringes we should make make it a practice that whenever we need an injection we use a disposable syringe after making the injection the needle should be immediately destroyed the syringe should be immediately destroyed so it should be ensured that this syringe and needle is not used by any other person so making regular use of making ensuring reuse of disposable syringe and needles it also spreads the it also prevents the spread of aids right so these are some methods by which we can prevent ourselves from contacting aids there are some miscon misconceptions or disbeliefs related to aids when the first aids patient when the first person was diagnosed aids in all india medical institute all the doctors and the paramedical staff they denied treating him they avoided contact with him in one newspaper report the person was thrown out of the hospital because at that time 
there was gross negligence about the knowledge how it spreads from one person to another person. If an HIV positive person and HIV negative person make handshakes, they are not likely to transmit the AIDS. So shaking hands with an HIV positive person does not spread AIDS. Putting on the clothes of HIV positive person does not spread AIDS. Hugging an HIV positive person does not spread AIDS. Right? Superficial kissing to an HIV person does not spread AIDS. In Kashmir, we have a tradition here. We eat food in a single large plate known as trami. In that trami, if an AIDS person, AIDS patient is also taking food, he is not likely to infect other persons. So sharing food with an AIDS person, AIDS person in trami does not spread AIDS, right? So AIDS is not spread by contact, it is not spread by hugging, it is not spread by sharing clothes, it is not spread by sh sharing food in the same plate, right? So these are misconceptions about the AIDS. So AIDS is only spread through sexu unprotected sexual intercourse, it is only spread through contact of the body fluids. Body fluids between HIV positive and HIV negative person should not be made, right? Body fluid exchange should not be done, right? And Sharing of hypodermic needles and syringes that also spreads the AIDS, right? So that is about the prevention of AIDS. Now, is this AIDS curable? So far, AIDS is said to be a non-curable disease. Although a therapy has been made available, but that therapy is very costly and that needs a strict, very strict schedule. So, so far we treat AIDS as, as an uncurable disease, although the cure is made available. There is a therapy known as therapy means treatment. There is a therapy known as HART, H-A-A-R-T, HART. Highly active, highly active anti-retroviral therapy. This therapy has the full potential of curing an AIDS patient. Highly active anti-retroviral therapy has the full potential of curing an AIDS patient. Then what is the problem with this therapy? This therapy, first of all, it is very costly. It is very costly. It is beyond the reach of, beyond the reach of most of the people. Most of the people. So it is very costly therapy. It is beyond the reach of most of the people. Number seven, it needs a strict schedule. The most disciplined person of the world does even falter in following the schedule of this therapy. So in this therapy, there are different types of drugs used and they should be administered into the body at a particular time on a particular day and in, within a particular interval. So it makes very difficult for the people to follow the schedule of this therapy. So people falter in following it a schedule. So that makes it inefficient, right? So this heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy, it has got the full potential. It can cure an AIDS patient. So what are its problems then? So for number first problem is that it is very costly. It is beyond the reach of most of the people. Most of the people cannot afford this therapy because it is very costly. Number second, it needs a strict schedule, right? That medicines are to be taken during different periods of the day within a specific, specified period of time. If anyone makes, if anyone forgets 
taking the drug at the same you know, specific time, then the therapy becomes inefficient, right? So in this therapy, different types of drugs. It is a multi-drug therapy. Different types of types of drugs are used simultaneously. It involves use of different types of drugs. And these different types of drugs, they are to be administered in a particular schedule. And for that reason, it becomes very difficult to follow this treatment. So which are the drugs which are used in highly active antiretroviral therapy? The first class of drugs is known as protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors. These protease inhibitors, they inhibit the enzymes which are used by HIV for cleaving its polypeptide. HIV, when it enters into human T helper cells, it carries out reverse transcription. HIV is a retrovirus. HIV is a retrovirus. That means it is a RNA virus. Right? So it has got RNA. So from it is RNA, it first forms DNA. It for, first forms DNA. By the help of an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase. And the process known as reverse transcription. Reverse transcription. So these retroviruses, they first show reverse transcription. From their RNA, they form DNA. Then from this DNA, they form messenger RNA. This messenger RNA, it has got the information for the proteins which are required by the virus in its multiplication. So this messenger RNA, it will be expressed, it will be translated. Messenger RNA is translated and it forms a polyprotein. It forms a polyprotein. It forms a long chain of similar proteins. This long chain of similar protein molecules is known as a polyprotein. Then this virus, it produces an enzyme which cuts this polyprotein into smaller fragments. Virus produces an enzyme which cuts this polyprotein into smaller fragments by the help of its enzyme. Then these smaller fragments of proteins, they are used for forming viral capsid in which it packs its RNA. Then this protein is used in the formation of viral capsid in which it packs its RNA. So this is how the virus replicates in our body. So the virus, it first carries out reverse transcription, it forms DNA in our cells. Then from DNA, that DNA, it forms messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is translated and it forms a long protein chain known as a polyprotein, right? Then the virus itself produces some enzymes which cut this polyprotein into smaller fragments. Each of the fragment is used by the virus then in formation of new viral, viral particles, right? So, protease inhibitors are the drugs which block this enzyme, which is used by virus for formation of protein capsules, for formation of protein capsules. So, when this enzyme is blocked by these protease inhibitors, virus is not able to form new viral particles. And the viral load, virus load in body fluids that abruptly follows down. So viral in viral multiplication is set up by these protease inhibitors. These protease inhibitors they include drugs like indinavir, indinavir, retonavir.
that we now give. So drugs like indinavir, retinavir, sacrinavir, they are all protease inhibitors. They inhibit, they stop the viral multiplication by blocking the enzyme, which is responsible for cutting polyprotein into small protein fragments. And those small protein fragments are used by the virus for formation of new viral particles. So when we block this enzyme, the virus is not able to synthesize new viral particles. So the viral load in body fluids suddenly falls down, right? And it provides immune system a chance to recover, right? So this is first class of these drugs. Then another class of drugs is used. Another class of drugs which is used for controlling this HIV is known as nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So these drugs, they are analogs of the nucleosides. A normal nucleoside is like this. We have discussed about the nucleosides. Suppose this is adenine. This is a pentose sugar. <coughs> this is a normal nucleoside. Resembling with this nucleoside are certain drugs, but they do not have an OH group at their carbon third position. It is a drug So these are two different substances. This is adenosine and nucleoside. Adenosine. So this is a drug which resembles with adenosine, which resembles with adenosine. It has also got adenine, it has got pentose sugar. But at its carbon third position, but at its carbon third position, it is deficient. It is deficient in a hydroxyl group. In a normal nucleoside, there is a hydroxyl group at carbon third position. In this nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitor, this hydroxyl group is missing at carbon third position. So these are the drugs which resemble with the normal nucleosides. They are given to the patient. They are given to the patient. So when virus uses these ready-made nucleosides, into its genetic material, where virus incorporates these ready-made nucleoside analogs into its genetic material. Other nucleotides cannot bind to it. So this nucleoside, it joins with a phosphate group, it forms first a nucleotide, then one nucleotide joins with another nucleotide, another nucleotide, polynucleotide chains are formed. But when these nucleosides are used, it may join with a phosphate group. But it cannot combine with another nucleosides. Why? Because it is lacking OH group at carbon third. So when one of these nucleosides is used by virus in replicating its genetic material, the replication gets blocked. The reverse transcriptase enzyme gets blocked. So DNA is not formed, right? So these drugs are known as nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors. They include AZT, azidothymidine. Is it 
hybridine or it is also known as ziduvidine it is also known as ziduvidine then there is another drug that is known as abc abacavir then there is another drug that is known as zolcitabine So these are all nucleoside analog, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So these drugs, they are analogous to the normal nucleosides of the body. But, so they resemble with the normal nucleosides. But they differ from them also. These synthetic nucleotides, nucleosides, they are deficient in hydroxyl group at carbon third. When virus uses these nucleosides in replication of its DNA, in replication of its genetic material, in formation of DNA from its RNA. These nucleosides, they inhibit the synthesis of nucleotides. They inhibit the synthesis of DNA. Reverse transcriptase enzyme gets inhibited because they are not having OH group here. So another nucleotide cannot join to it. So this formation of DNA from RNA, it is inhibited by introduction of these nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors, right? So this is another another drug which has got the full potential of treating AIDS. Then there is another category of drugs. That is known as non-nucleoside or non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So in this category of drugs, nucleoside analogs or nucleotide analogs, they are not used. Directly the reverse transcriptase enzyme is inhibited. Directly the reverse transcriptase enzyme is inhibited, right? And these drugs include, for example, there is a drug known as ifavirin. It can directly block reverse transcriptase enzyme. Neviraprine, Nevirapine or Dilaviridine. So these drugs they do not use, make use of nucleoside or nucleotide analogs. These drugs directly inhibit the reverse transcriptase enzyme. So combined use of these protease inhibitors. Nucleoside analog or nucleotide analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors and non nucleoside, non nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, their combined use has the full potential of curing AIDS. But what is the problem? This therapy is very costly and it has got a very difficult schedule to follow, right? So if a person is fully determined, if a person is having the money and is fully determined to follow this therapy, then he is likely to completely get cured from AIDS, right? So that is all about this acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Are we having some time or not? I think our time is over now. So thank you for being with me.